Ezra. Ezra chapter 3. All right. So, yeah, a, a recap and of bringing you up to speed. So this, this part of the book of Ezra is actually written prior to the person of Ezra introducing himself. And it tells the story about the children of Israel coming back from the Babylonian captivity. It's set in the early 500s BC, uh, at a time when the superpower of the day were the Persians, uh, what is today the Iranians, and I suppose Iraqis too are also Persians. But you know, there was a time when those uh, that 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 people were the most powerful people on earth and the most advanced. Um, and they still hearken back, still, it's still uh, today. The Iranians uh, think of themselves in terms of being Persians. That is, they, I mean, you, you look at what that tiny little country does now in terms of shooting its mouth off and telling everybody how big and great they are. Um, it's, it's still the fact that for centuries they were the biggest superpower on earth and their, their kings were uh, wise and uh, extremely powerful. Just don't know they're not anymore. Uh, so at any rate, so it's the Persians who let the children of Israel go and let them reestablish things in Jerusalem. So end of chapter 3, uh, they have already began building, begun building, they've already begun building the, the, uh, the altar. They built, that was the first thing they built when they came back to Jerusalem. Before they, they started even the foundation of the temple itself, they built an altar so the sacrificial system could resume again. They'd been in captivity for 70 years, so it's now after 70 years, the sacrifices go back into place. When they travel back, they bring hundreds of priests with them and Levites because the first order of business when they come back is establishing the right worship of God. And the sacrifices for them were sacraments. This is the way that, that God forgave their sins through an outward means. And they were diligent at it. This, is, this was first, which means they learned their lesson while they were in captivity for those 70 years. That the reason they were taken off captive in the first place was their unbelief and their belief in false gods. So they come back, they're going to do it right. And God is first, the altar is first. Uh, then comes the temple itself. So verse 8, chapter 3, after they get the... Uh, after they get the... After they pay the carpenters. Yeah, verse 7, they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and the people of Tyre and Sidon to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea, yeah, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Yeah, actually, that's, that's an important verse. Um, the original temple of Solomon was made with the cypress trees and the cedar trees, rather, of Lebanon. So the new temple they're building, they're still using the same source materials. Uh, I, I, I've been told that at one point in time, the cedars of Lebanon, that Lebanon was densely packed with these things. Um, in, in fact, Lebanon's national flag is a cedar tree. Now, there aren't as many of these cedars of Lebanon anymore, uh, but they're big, massive beasts, these trees, uh, and they have a reputation for being you know, particularly strong. As cedars, it's insect resistant. You know, when I was in Taiwan, uh, the, one, the one day I had for sightseeing, it took me up to a mountain. 
uh, and, and did a, you know, just a hiking trail through the cedars in Taiwan. And they are the Taiwanese equivalent to our sequoias. They're not as big as a sequoia, but they're 12, 1,200 years old, 1,500 years old, and 20-foot uh, plus diameter on these things. Uh, um, circumference, rather. The diameter is probably actually more than 20 feet. The diameter on those things were 15, 15 feet range. And here, uh, the diameter, from what I could tell, of these, uh, these cedars of Lebanon, uh, they could have as much as an eight foot diameter. They could be 130 feet tall. So these are huge, massive trees. So they have them specially shipped in from Lebanon. Uh, and that's what they use as they did for the first temple. But that's expensive. You know, it's a country away. It's immediately north of Israel, but they still had to float them, uh, pay all those workers. They, they would have been hugely expensive, but they spared no expense. So now verse 8. Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, Jeshua, the son of Jazadak, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of captivity to Jerusalem, began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel with his sons, and the sons of Judah arose as one to oversee those working on the house of God, the sons of Henadad with their sons and their brother and the Levites. Now, Ezra is very concerned with names and numbers. He's a historian. Uh, he's, he's telling this t the story with great detail, which really helps to solidify the truth of it all. This is how it happened. This isn't, this isn't myth. Uh, this isn't legend. These are actual people with actual names that can be traced back in family trees. The second month of the second year coincides with the time stamp in chapter 3, verse 1, that when the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities, uh, the people gathered together as one man in Jerusalem. So the seventh month there, and now here finally, second month of the second year. So it had been a period of 17 months after their arrival in Jerusalem when they finally start building the temple. Prior to this, they had built the altar, so they had a worship in place from day one. But then they settled their homes, got everybody in place, got things prepped. It took 17 months to get ready to start building the temple. Verses 12 to, no, 11, 10. 10 and 11. Then the builders laid the foundations of the temple of the Lord, the priesthood, and their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Construction was accompanied by worship. This wasn't just a building project. This was restoration of the worship of Israel to the one true God. And every step of the way, even the laying of the foundation, was accompanied by worship. Uh, curious that what we use for a meal prayer, you know, come Lord Jesus, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever, that part of it, uh, is... Uh, is the original praise prayer of the people over the temple. All right, if you look in 2 Chronicles, just take a peek there, 2 Chronicles 5, 11 to 14, you see why they are doing this. The worship is mirroring Solomon's and the, and the first temple every step of the way. Uh, this is done consciously. So when, the, when Solomon's temple was constructed, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 11 to 14, uh, And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves uh, without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers, 
all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun with their sons and their brethren stood at the east end of the altar clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Uh, indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, praising the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. They're singing the same thing, having the same kind of, of praise and worship that was present at the construction of the first temple. You know, because this, this was the point in time when their temple was designed by God and the people were right in their worship with God. So they are restoring the original worship, the pure worship of God. Now at the second building. All right. Then, 12 to 13, kind of a weird thing happens. But as many of the priests and Levites and heads of the fathers' houses who were old men, who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes, yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. It's a different character than the first time when the first temple uh, and the people were shouting and worshiping and it says the sound was heard a long way off. This time it's a different kind of sound. It's joy mixed with weeping. Why? Why did the older men weep? Yeah. It's more, I don't know, most of the commentators say they weep because the second temple doesn't approach the glory of the first temple, which, you know, might be part of it, but I, I don't know. I don't think that's it. I don't necessarily think it's a weeping of sorrow. It might be. It's, you know, it's, that's the weird thing about human emotions, um, particularly for some of the female types, that you can cry and laugh simultaneously, uh, and be happy and sad simultaneously. And sometimes it's hard to know which is which. Uh, and, and, and I think that's kind of what's happening here. That yes, in part it was sorrow that because they saw the old one and this temple wasn't everything the old one was, but it's also a, a weeping of joy that finally it's all being rebuilt. So it's, it's some, some, something in between sorrow and joy. It's a, very emotional thing uh, on, on many levels. Uh, but these older men had to be well, probably at least in their mid-70s because they've been in captivity for 70 years. So if, in order for them to remember the first temple, they would have had to have been you know, at least five or six or, or older. So anyway, it, this this noise going up. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure in part it is. Yeah. That they were weeping for, for sorrow because of their brothers and sisters don't get that sacrament, should we say? Yeah. yeah all, all I'm sure was part of it, yeah. I'm sure there was all kinds of different thoughts and things going through their mind, including weeping for their brethren and weeping for the, how far Israel had fallen over the, over the centuries from what it was once, from the first temple times. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there were all kinds of different things going on there. All right. So now things are going along pretty well. We've got this kind of highly charged worship going on. We've got the people fired up about building the temple. The work is coming along nicely. Everything is great. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. 
Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple to the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of uh, Azarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now things suddenly take a turn as we will see. But it says the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. Uh, the, the word adversary means, you know, literally foe, enemy. Uh, it can also, in the Hebrew I've got noted there, the word can also mean distress or a hard pebble, which is, which is a weird thing it can mean. Uh, a hard pebble because it would get caught in the hooves of the horses and be an irritant to the horses. So they had to dig them out. So the word for a, for a pebble in the hoof was an enemy. Interesting. Yeah. That is, that is the question. At this stage of the game, in these first two verses, um, I think, their, I think their intention is sincere, misguided, which is why in the following verses it'll be re, their help will be rejected. But at the level of faith where they were, I think it was sincere. The problem was it was a false faith they had. Um, who these people are, we know. Uh, if you look in 2 Kings chapter 17, it'll tell us who these people are who now come forward. And it'll also tell you what the problem is going to be. 2 Kings 17, 22 to 24. All right, 2 Kings 17, 22 to 24. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. That's the fall of the, 11, of the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom. 24, then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharium and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel, and they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. So these people are the descendants of these foreigners from Babylon who have been carted in and given the lands of the Israels, Israelites. They are not Jewish. They are Sam Samaritans, whose ethnicity is actually Assyrian and Babylonian. So they're basically Iranians who have been transplanted into Israel. It, yes, exactly. Because the Samaritans now are no longer Jews. The Samaritans are only occupying Jewish land. They're in the Promised Land. But they are ultimately Persians or you know, Assyrians. So that's who these people are. Keep your place here in 2 Kings. We're going to come back to it in a bit. All right, so uh, they claim that they worship the God of Israel here, back in Ezra. They said, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the day, uh, days of uh, Eshaddon, Ez Ezra Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. So they claim to worship the true God. Do they, though, is the question. 2 Kings, same chapter, start in verse 25. And it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the rituals of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them. Indeed, they are killing them because they do not know the rituals of the God of the land. 
Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Send there one of the priests whom you brought from there. Let him go and dwell there, and let him teach them the rituals of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. However, every nation continued to make gods of its own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, had made every nation in the cities where they dwelt. The men of Babylon made Succoth, uh, Benath. The men of Cuth made Nergath. Those are names of gods. The men of Hamath made Ashima, etc. Uh, verse 32, so they feared the Lord, and from every class they appointed for themselves priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared the Lord, yet served their own gods, according to the rituals of the nations. So, these, these people seem to recognize the fact that God wasn't happy with them occupying the promised land because they were all dying by these surprise lion attacks. Uh, so they wanted to make peace with the God of Israel. They get a priest in there who teaches them the rituals, but they never give up the false worship of their own gods. All they do is add the worship of the true God to their worship of the false gods. So they still are idolatrous. They're polytheists. And God, the true God, is his one God among many. They think that's what it means to worship the true God. So now here, when they come to the people returning from captivity saying, hey, we want to help you because we worship the same God, the original Israelites, they see right through it. They know they don't because they're polytheists. Uh, the true God is an all or nothing thing. You reject every other God in order to worship the one true God. They didn't do that. So they don't really worship the true God. They just kind of are going through the rituals. So a couple of asterisks on the handout. Uh, things to note from this, not everybody who says they worship the true God does. And two, it is not unusual for people to adopt aspects of the true God that they like and add them to the gods of their own creation. This is the nature of all false teaching. You know, in our day and age, it is very common for people to say, well, we all worship the same God, we just have some different understandings. Or we all worship the same God, we just have different interpretations on a couple of points. Sometimes that's true, but other times there's a serious question about whether we actually do still worship the same God. You know, just because you're holding to some of the principles of the one true God and you acknowledge the existence of the one true God does not mean we have the same God. You know, if, if you are worshiping a God that you say is the triune God, you talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You talk about Jesus dying on the cross. But then you use this God to excuse all kinds of the sins and perversions we have in our day. You know, your, your God suddenly uh, has no problems with things like homosexuality or uh, abortion. Uh, or your God is the lawgiver, and if your life is just uh, closely enough mirroring the commandments, your God is going to love you, even though you say, talk about Jesus on the cross and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's not the same God anymore. That's some aspects of the true God, but you've created all your own things and added them to it. You know, that's exactly what's going on here. People coming up, hey, we were the same God, but you don't. So, what they're running into is exactly what we have in our day. People claiming to have the true God, but their actual worship is not the true God. They only have some elements that they like, like God is love. So to the question that, that was asked here, is their offer sincere? I think at this point it probably is, as far as they understand it. They want to help the Jews reconstruct this temple to whatever God. 
You know, this is, this is to the true God, they're Israel's God, but hey, you know, that's just one God among many, and they're, they're good with that, and they'll help out. Verse 3, the answer of the Jews to that. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build the house of our God, but we alone will build it to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, king of Persia, has commanded us. So why did the Jews refuse this offer to help? Especially considering the fact that the extra help they would have got done sooner. Probably these people would have thrown in some money, so they would have got done uh, cheaper. There were a lot of benefits for them taking advantage of this offer. So why reject it? Because this entire thing has been about restoration of the one true faith. It's not just a building project. This is restoration of the faith of Israel. Uh, by introducing idolatry into that uh, would have been undoing everything they were about. So they reject the offer. And on the handout, too, are there implications here for how the church today raises money? I think there is. What we, what we do is church. And not just building a building, but everything we do is church. Sending out missionaries, witnessing of Christ in the world, is all an act of faith. We support the church because of the one true faith and being saved by Christ. We are gods exclusively. And we don't look to the world to fulfill our responsibilities to God. Support of the church is our God-given responsibility. Uh, so when it comes to raising funds for projects, we raise them from within because it's an act of faith. Not any, any way we can because it's an act of community. So things like government funding and that sort of thing. I am not in favor of the church taking advantage of government programs and getting government funding for things because then you're beholden to the false god of government. So we do what we do because it's our responsibility before God and our act of worship and devotion to God, not just as a job that's got to get done. Yes, I think that's absolutely the concern. Right, it would no longer be pure. It would be a religion that was basically agreeing to disagree with the false teachers. And we'll all just get along and be one happy family and just kind of overlook these little false gods on the high places in your, your area. Right back to where they were before they were carted off into captivity. That's right. Yep, they, they, they would have just gone right back to the reason God made the exile in the first place. Yep. Uh, at the end of the, the asterisk there under number three, by citing the ruling of Cyrus, they're claiming legal protection for their activities, and it's a veiled threat that the Persians support them, and they better not mess with them lest they incur the wrath of the Persians. Now you see human nature going to overdrive. Verse four and five. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Uh, they discouraged the people. Literally in the Hebrew it says, weaken their hands. They, they tried to make them give up the project by making it as miserable as they possibly could and putting every roadblock in their way. When it says they hired counselors, I think probably that means they hired lawyers. Even back then, you know, lawyers were the devil's tool for wrecking stuff. 
uh, and causing problems. So that's, that's what they do. They hire the best lawyers they can afford, and they put up every roadblock they can protesting what Israel is doing to stop them. And they're successful, as we will see. Uh, the word for counselors is also the word for conspirators. You know, and I think probably part of that, too, is they also bribed people along the way. They're getting cedars from Lebanon. Well, hey, you can mess that up, bribing the people of Lebanon not to deliver the cedars in time. You know, you can mess with the quality of wood they're sending so that it has to be rejected and they've got to get another load. There's all kinds of ways you can mess this up, and I'm sure they did. So even back then, in, in what we might consider the golden age of faith, you've got these forces messing up everything along the way. There was never a golden age of faith. The church has always been at war with the world. So verse 3, no, verse 5. Verse 5, yeah, okay, it's counselors until the reign of... 6, verse 6. Now, in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes also, uh, Bishlam, oh boy, these are not easy, Mithradath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. All right, so again, Ezra's need for historical accuracy. He names 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 and kings names. The two kings named here have caused a lot of confusion. Uh, you know, back in those days, people very often had more than one name. You had a Jewish name, you had a Persian name, you might have had an Egyptian name. That wasn't at all uncommon for a person to have two or three names. So just because he's named these names, historians don't know exactly who they're talking about. Uh, some say this is Xerxes and Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Xerxes' huge name, one of the, the, the most vicious and powerful of the Persian kings. Uh, but the problem with that is, timeline-wise, he comes after Darius. Uh, this problem ends with Darius. We know that. So from Cyrus to Darius, it's about 15 years, 16 years. Ar uh, Xerxes and Artaxerxes are way down here, 70 years later. But in between Darius and Cyrus, there are two other kings. Uh, and that's who we think it is. Uh, there's, there's Cambyses and a, and a guy named, uh, where is it, Pseudosmerdes, there's quite a name for you, who are probably coinciding with these names that it's listing. Uh, the uh, the Camnidus guy, Cambyses, reigned seven and a half years after Cyrus. He was the king immediately after Cyrus. Uh, and then um, this other guy, it lists, Artaxerxes, Probably pseudo Smyrna's raid seven months is all. So as they complain to Cyrus, they complain to the next king, they complain to the one after that, and then they complain to Darius, who's the fourth one in line, trying to stop this. They're successful. A little bit more, verses 8 to 10. Uh, so uh, Rehum, the commander of uh, the commander in Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to the king Artaxerxes in this fashion. So this, this is uh, verse 9 and 10. It, we're going to skip. It's nothing more than a return address of a letter. These are the people who are writing it. Again, names, places, a commander, scribe, what their job was. So this is, can be historically verified. So that's the people who wrote it. Verse 11 and following is the letter, and that's worth reading. This is the copy of the letter they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. 
Now, because we received support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the, king, the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king uh, that a search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in, as in former times, or in former times, for which cause the city was destroyed. We inform the king that if the city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you have no dominion over the region beyond the river. What slime balls. They, they do exactly what any, any lawyer would do in our day. You complain to government the two biggest fears of government, sedition and loss of income. You're going to have an unruly bunch of people who are going to fight against the government. You don't want that. And you're going to lose money. You're going to lose taxes and stuff. You don't want that either. So the, the two buttons you push with a politician, they push. Despite the fact, I mean, they're talking about rebuilding the walls of the city. That hasn't happened yet. They're still working on the walls of the temple. So none of this has happened. Despite the fact Israel does not have an army, it can't fight against Persia for Pete's sakes. These are exiles. It's a ragtag group of builders they, and priests. These are, these are not warriors by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and, and money, they have nothing. They came with virtually nothing. They're exiles. So it's all trumped up. There's no evidence of any of this being a serious threat, but that's what the lawyers paint it as. And the king, who's not Cyrus anymore by this time, does what you would expect the king to do when he hears all that. So verse 17 to 22. Then the king sent an answer. To Rahim, the commander, Shishmi, the scribe, the rest of their com companions who dwell in Samaria, the rest of the region beyond the river, peace, and so forth. The letter that you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has made insurrection against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem that have ruled over all the provinces, provinces beyond the river, and tax, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease, that the city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. <clears throat> Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? So, yep, they have been rebellious, and yep, there wasn't packed taxes being paid to the superpowers. They were keeping it for themselves, so you better stop them. The, the, the slimeball lawyers got their, their will. They did what they came to do. They twisted everything in such a way that they shut them down. So, again, so much for a golden age of faith. The church has always had this kind of opposition from the world. Always. Because truth can't stand with error, and error sure doesn't want truth around. You know, there's, there's also kind of an interesting progression here. That their initial contact starts off just looking for acceptance. Accept us. You know, we want to work with you. We want to be one with you. And then, once acceptance doesn't quite work out, then immediately they go on the attack and try and shut down the opposition. Now they want dominance. They don't want acceptance. They want to dominate. And again, exactly the pattern we see in our world when it comes to sin. The first thing is always accept us. We're not looking to change anything. All we're looking for is acceptance. And then once they have acceptance, the next thing they do is try and eliminate the truth and anybody who stands in their way. So the, the devil has never changed his tactics because they're effective. All right, any thoughts or comments about this mess that they've created here? All right, now, so the apparent victory of God's enemies. Verse 23 and 24. Now when the copy of the king of Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rahim, uh, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. 
Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Okay, so there's our time stamp. It starts up again with the second year of Darius, king of Persia. So we're looking there at uh, 14 years that they managed to stop construction on the temple. And who has the army? They do. They just complained about Israel causing sedition against Persia. But they're the ones with the army that can cause sedition. You know, the hypocrisy of it all. And you can just see the, you know, the, the smug scene playing out. These pompous enemies stride in Jerusalem with a, with a royal decree, a law in their hands. And, and stick it in their face and tell them to shut down. Now, how discouraging that would have been if you were a Jew. You had just been on such a high, high, worshiping God, everything's coming together, and then bam, just like that, you're down in the gutter, the, everything has come to an absolute stop. You know, what, what trouble the devil causes to the children of God. Always has been, always will be. Um, it's not, as we'll see when we get into this again when, I, when we get back, it's not, an, not a permanent victory, it's a temporary victory. The Jews will find a way around this, but it's successful for 14 years shutting things down. So just some questions at the end. So what lessons for being a Christian in this world can we take away from this? Yes, and God has always preserved his church despite it. Yeah, God has, has always managed to find a way to still bless his church and make it work even when the entire world is set against it. So, right, don't be discouraged when this stuff happens. It, just, it, it means you're one of God's children, so thanks be to God. devil wouldn't waste time on you if you weren't. I <laughs> wish he'd sent in lions. <laughs> the, the, lions are, the lions will be there at the end, I think, when it's too late. But Yeah. So, right, don't be discouraged. God is in control even if it seems like the world is winning. Uh, and, and don't be surprised when the world turns against you. They always have. And what had these attacks of God's enemies not stopped. They didn't stop the worship. They, they didn't stop the worship to the one true God. They tried. That's ultimately what was their goal. But it failed from the get-go. All they stopped was the building of a building. Which to them, you know, in their mindset, if you stop the building, you shut the whole thing down because the building is kind of the whole locus of it all but not to the Jews. They built the altar first, and that, that hasn't come down. They're still offering sacrifices. They're still worshiping. All the, all the building is is a building next to that altar. So they can do just fine worshiping the one true God without a building. So the worship of the one true God will prevail even if the world tries to shut us down. How could this have been good for the Jews? And kind of goes hand in hand with how is frustration and suffering good for God's people today? It makes you stronger. It makes you focus on what it's really all about. It's not a thing. It's not about a building. Those things are temporary. But the worship of the one true God is eternal. They have that. So in a way, it's kind of a reality check for the Jews to remind them of the fact that with the worship of the one true God and his blessings and grace, they have everything. They don't need a building. They don't, they don't need to re rebuild Jerusalem even. So yeah, it's a, it's a way that, it's a testing of the faith that God uses as a way of reinforcing his saving truths. 
So I do think that was the effect it had, and I do think that's the effect suffering has in our lives, too. There's nothing to make you realize what's, imp what's truly important than to have things taken away from you and suffer. And then you recognize that it's only by grace you live every day, and it's, you know, it's, as long as you have the goodness of God, you can lose everything else and you're still fine. So the lessons God teaches us, he taught them. All right, we've got to stop there. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your blessings, and we thank you even for times of suffering. And pray that you grant us faith to receive both as we ought. Be with us this day. Bless us in our worship, and cement us in your truth forever. In Jesus' name, amen.